welcome to the American Maritime Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Carpenter, Vice President of the American Maritime Podcast. If you're new to the American Maritime Podcast, we talk about issues that matter to the 650,000 American men and women who make maritime work in this great country. We are honored to have a very special guest with us today, Congresswoman Kat Kamek. Congresswoman Kamek represents Florida's third congressional district in the northern part of the state. That includes Alachua, Bradford, Clay, Putnam, and Union counties, and a large portion of Marion County, including the city of Ocala. Fun fact, she was also the youngest Republican woman to be elected to Congress in 2020. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to see my friends. Excellent. So first, we want to learn a little bit more about you. What inspired you to pursue a career in public service? <laughs> well, I can tell you that it wasn't on my list of things to do. Um, I had actually grown up on a small cattle ranch. I uh, was the first in my family to go to college, daughter of a single mom, very working class, blue collar family. And uh, after college, I actually wanted to go into the energy industry and eventually was going to take over the family business of commercial sandblasting. But uh, we ended up losing our cattle ranch because of a big government program in the uh, 2011, I believe it was, yeah, April of 2011. And after being homeless, that really kind of changed my whole world view. And I decided at that point that even if I didn't want to go into politics, politics was gonna have an impact on my life. And so I got involved. And that's how I started my journey in uh, public service, was uh, having a personal experience where I was directly impacted and got in the fight to make a change. And here we are today, and we're, we're fighting on a number of different issues for constituents and for people all around the country. Oh, that perspective gives you, I'm sure, a great deal of empathy with what your constituents may be experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um, I tell people all the time, especially when I run into them, uh, you know, in the grocery store, at the gas station, you know, just around town and, or if I'm on the road and, and people say, oh, that's, you know, really cool that you're a congresswoman, you know, but I don't really do politics. And I'm like, well, politics does you. Yeah. And it's from the, the price of gas to the groceries that you're buying, you know, at home to uh, the taxes that you're paying and basically anything that is in your house around your kitchen table, it is there. And there is a some political policy that is impacting how it got there and how much it cost you to bring it into your home. So uh, I tell people you need to get involved. Even if you don't want to be involved, you have to be involved. Absolutely. You're also a proud alumna of the Naval War College. Tell us a little bit about how that education has shaped your perspective and your priorities in Congress. Well, I actually went through as a civilian and got my master's in, in national defense and strategic studies, emphasis in information systems, counterterrorism. And I did it as a civilian. Um, I was the only civilian in my class. And um, it was it was an incredible experience. But at the time, I was serving as a uh, deputy chief of staff to a member of Congress who was serving on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And so much of our foreign policy goes hand in glove with our forward thinking, pre-positioning, our military strategy, the geopolitics of theater and war and deterrence. It's all wrapped up into a giant package. And so as I was serving, the district as the, the deputy chief, and also trying to be the best deputy chief I could be, I figured that I would need to get some background in, in what I would be advising my then boss uh, on in terms of policy and planning. And so that's why I took the step of, you know, going to the Naval War College, getting my master's degree. And it was one of the most rewarding and important experiences of my life. And today I have a much better understanding of not just uh, war and defense and strategic studies, but really how all aspects lead into the basics of supply chain, uh, the logistics of commerce and trade, and how that can all uh, be made or broken from very small things. And it all just requires some strategic planning. So it, it is quite uh, an interesting 
thing that people don't expect when I tell them that, that I'm a graduate and an alumni of the Naval War College. That is fascinating and just incredibly relevant to what our country and our world are experiencing right now. Wow. Yeah, it, it is a very timely. In fact, I wrote my master's thesis on the need to create uh, another service academy to meet today's challenges, which I believe are the cyber sphere. And so I am now as a member of Congress am using my thesis and working with several of my colleagues in creating the next service academy, which will be the cyber academy, very much like West Point or the Naval Academy or the Air Force Academy, but with an emphasis on cyber to make up the gap that we have. We really have a shortage of cyber warriors, both in private sector, but also in public sector. And when you look at the federal service and then DOD, we have a shortage in both of those paths. So this would be a way for us to encourage students, really the best of the best, to commission into either federal service or into military service and serve their country. And that would give them an incredible resume when they complete their time in the service to then go out and be productive members in the private sector, a real value add to whatever company or industry they would choose to be in. But cybersecurity is so important and really a driving issue and a driving challenge that we're addressing here in Congress. And as you can see, whether we're talking about uh, an actual big box uh, theory, conventional war that we're seeing play out in Ukraine, unfortunately, there's also a cyber element that's playing out. And then, of course, there's constant attacks from non-state actors that are government and industries continually having to contend with. So cybersecurity is a top issue, a top priority that we need to address. And I'm really excited about the opportunity to help uh, us help the United States and really help industry move the needle in that next cutting edge technology and workforce. Oh, that, that really is an idea whose time has come. Thank you for your work on that. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your work on economic issues, something that I know has also been really important during your time in Congress. Florida's maritime infrastructure has seen some improvement over the last year with expanded dredging at Jacksport, um, with an expanding dry dock in your district to help build and repair American vessels. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of the port uh, on your district and the surrounding area. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, this is something that, of course, being a Floridian, you're a little bit biased when you've got 14 ports, you know, that, that your state is, is home to. And so uh, we we love our ports in Florida and they are major economic drivers. And of course, Jacksport has been, I affectionately refer to as my baby for the better part of a decade, like I said, serving the region and, and the district as the deputy chief for so long. But then now as the member seeing firsthand all of these efforts um, come to fruition. I mean, today you look at Jack's Port and it is $31 billion in economic impact that Jack's Port has on our region. It truly is remarkable about uh, when you think about how that port drives so much development and so much uh, commerce. It is amazing. And when you think about the number of people that Jacksport actually serves in the region, uh, and you're gonna have to forgive me, I don't know right off the top of my head, the radius in terms of miles, but I believe it's a hundred million people are serviced uh, with goods that come through Jacksport. Um, and again, I'd have to get the, the radius, but it's, it's remarkable. When you think about a state like Florida that's growing so rapidly, we're approaching 22 million people so quickly. This is something that we needed to do in taking that next step for one, meeting the needs and demands of our own state uh, where we have population booming and increased needs for, for goods. But you look at what we're seeing in the maritime industry, this shift towards uh, the post Panamax uh, size ships where we need to at least be at 47 feet to make that draft work. And so that was a project that we started many, many years ago and I remember having some of the, the battles, uh, the word of the, the Water and Resources Redevelopment Authorization uh, Act that was constantly being fought over in Congress where we have to do this several times over. I mean, some of the battles with the Army Corps of Engineers that we've had, it's all worth it in the end because Jacksport really is the crown jewel when you think about Jacksonville, but also the Southeast. Um, I, I know I'm gonna do something a little bit silly, um, and you probably, if you're if you're listening to this, you're not going to really get it. But I'm holding my hand up. If you're watching this, it'll make sense. 
But when you look at Jacksport, right, and you look at Florida, Florida is kind of like uh, your hand and your thumb. But Jacksport up here, it is the least hurricane prone, but it is also the furthest western port on the eastern seaboard. It's in line with Ohio. And when you think about why that's so important, you think about trucks, transportation, the cost of fuel today, and what it takes to get uh, our goods from the port out into market. That is critically important if you have a port on the eastern seaboard that is in line with Ohio, how much further in that it is, that's less trucking, that's less uh, truck miles that that food is going, less uh, truck miles that your goods are going, the faster it's getting into your home, your kitchens, your living rooms, et cetera. Uh, that is why Jack's Port is so important. It's not just the economic impact of $31 billion annually. It's not just the over 150,000 jobs that, in, that in, by extension, families that the port supports. It's that timeliness and that ability to meet the challenge of today, which of course we're facing supply chain and logistic issues, but meeting that just by the sheer uh, fact of where that port lies. That is why Jackson Port, Jacksonville is so important. Oh, you are an awesome ambassador for Jacksport. That was a <laughs> feel like I need a Jacksport hat. <laughs> yes, you do need a Jack. I want to go get a Jacksport hat now. That was a fantastic explanation. Let's zoom out a little bit more broadly. What are some of your priorities to ensure that the U.S. maintains our competitive edge economically? Well, you know, part of the reason why we are so competitive um, is one, our innovation. You know, people come from all over the world for what is called a CQ, which is our creative quotient. And it's that American ingenuity, that American innovation that constantly is driving efficiency. Um, and, and so you obviously have something that's built in in American industry and enterprise, and that's our innovation. I like to call it American grit because we perpetually figure out how to do things uh, with less, right? But one of the things that we are actually challenged with that is a self-inflicted problem is our regulatory environment. We tend to over-regulate as the rest of the world it doesn't set itself to the same standards. So that's actually a disadvantage that we have that we in Congress are working to put pressure on the administrative agencies to cut red tape. There's so much red tape out there that isn't making consumers safer uh, from products. It's not making the, the workplace safer. And I'm not saying that we need to get rid of all regulation, but there is a lot of unnecessary regulation out there that is driving up the cost of doing business, making it harder to produce here in America. And in really, if we're going to be competitive globally, we need to look at this from a macro level. Are we actually competing on the innovation side? Yes, I think we are. Are we competing in terms of our tax environment? Not so much in under this administration. Are we competing with labor? Well, I think we have some of the most talented workforce in America, but we have come to a place in America where we're paying people not to work. And when you talk about the maritime industry, for example, this is a specialized industry. It's not something that you can flip on a switch and then people just come and flock. You've got uh, longshoremen, you have tradesmen, you have all these different elements that tend to go where industry is flourishing. And if we shut out that industry hub through overregulation, through taxes, through an unfavorable business environment, that's when we're going to see this really start to get tough for us. So we've got some things that we've got to do to become competitive. But I think at the end of the day, I'll put up our American workers, our industries against any other in the world, and we will still come out on top. Well said. Let's turn to Homeland Security issues. We talked a little bit about cyber, but as a member of the House Homeland Security Committee, what do you see as the biggest Homeland Security challenges facing our country today? Oh, you know, I'd have to say, and, and not to make it super political, but I will say having sat um, as, as a ranking member for Subcommittee on Homeland Security, um, I see a lot of the challenges that don't make front page news. Um, our open border in along the Southwest region is our biggest national security threat today. And I say that because in the last year alone, we have seen over two dozen known individuals on the international terrorist watch list being apprehended. We have seen a dramatic, and I, I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough, a dramatic increase 
in cartel illegal activity along the border, building up networks um, with with resources that are rivaling that of the 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 government of Mexico. I, I mean, when you look at the smuggling operation that is occurring at the Southwest border, that is a $32 million a day uh, of what we are seeing. And that is absolutely incredible um, amount of money that is being made by the cartels, which is empowering them to continue building up networks, building up infrastructure. And when you don't have a secure border, you don't have a secure nation when we only have 10% of all of our commercial cargo being inspected at random, then it's just a numbers game. What is being smuggled through? You could have everything from um, pests and diseases that infect our domestic production of agriculture and crops or or livestock. That could wipe out um, an, an entire industry just by lack of having enough inspectors at the border. When you look at um, the weapons that can be smuggled in, the you know dirty bombs, things like this, these are all things that keep me up at night having seen firsthand the gaps that we have in terms of border security. And of course, border security isn't just limited to the Southwest border, it's our ports as well. And so our ports play an important role in how we manage what's coming in and making sure that we're protecting industry here at home while still maintaining an efficient flow of commerce and goods and services that are coming through. And I gotta give a shout out, of course, to um, our coast, our coasties because nobody does port security better than the Coast Guard and they're hugely, hugely important to the maritime industry. So always looking to work, looking forward to working with them because uh, whether it's LNG, whether it is um, you know port security, national security, it is uh, always remarkable to see what they're up to. Um, but beyond that, beyond the, the terrifying border situation that we're facing, I do think we have a real serious threat in our debt. Um, we are on an unsustainable path currently. When you see in 2021, we spent close to $7 trillion. Um, we're garnishing the wages of uh, our kids, our grandkids, but every American is facing an inflation tax today because of this government spending. And then of course you look at the, the global context of what is happening in Russia and Ukraine, and of course, China. China would love nothing more than to see uh, America taken off the world stage as, as the world's leading superpower. And they have a, a very large footprint across the globe that we are having to contend with, especially through their predatory lending practices. I could go on and on, but I'm sure your, your listeners and your viewers would probably not sleep well um, if I kept going. So we have plenty of challenges, but I remain optimistic that we will handle them uh, with flying colors and be better on the other side of it for having faced them. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. And and I think that's a good segue, actually, to the Jones Act, uh, which, as you know, requires that vessels that are moving cargo between U.S. ports, whether that's inland, coastal, non-contiguous, are owned by Americans, they're built by Americans, and they're crewed by Americans. Can you share a little bit about how, from your perspective, the Jones Act helps to safeguard American economic and homeland and national security? Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially representing a district where I have uh, a very prominent shipbuilder in my backyard. You know, this is something where we have industry that has been built around a policy. And it is absolutely wild when I talk to some of my colleagues who want to do away with the Jones Act. And I ask them, well, what do you say to all of those businesses that are multi-generation operations that have built their entire structure, their business model around a policy? And they say, well, that's just tough. I said, well, that's not good enough. Because when you look at what the Jones Act is all about, it is about protecting American industry. It's about putting America first. And there is a huge national security component when you think about the Jones Act. You know, I work very closely with Crowley, for example. They have Jones Act vehicles, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> vessels. Um, but you also need to think about what that means for security when we are uh, talking about commerce and protecting our supply chains. Right now, of course, we all know that the, the global supply chain is, is broken. And I think that there is a role for the Jones Act to play in, in making sure that the United States is really putting a focus back on American products, using American 
uh, maritime operations to move our products and our goods and our services. We've become so reliant on overseas uh, manufacturing and logistics that we've forgotten about what is best and that's in our backyard. So I think that there is definitely some room for, for us to update the Jones Act and make it a little bit more conducive to businesses that are continuing to use Jones Act and be Jones Act compliant. But I do think that at the end of the day, it's a policy that we need to stick with. So I'm proud to support the Jones Act. Well, thank you. Thank you for that support. Uh, as the top Republican on the Homeland Security Committee's Emergency Preparedness, Preparedness Subcommittee, can you talk a little bit about the role that American Maritime plays in supporting communities that are affected by uh, natural disasters or other emergencies? Absolutely. And I, I mean, you look no further than Hurricane Maria when um, we saw Maria basically devastate Puerto Rico, where, of course, we have a huge footprint there, um, be it LNG or otherwise. And you look at how our ships were pre-positioned, ready to go, and they led the charge when it came to recovery efforts on the island. Um, I remember being on the phone with Crowley and others as we were talking about getting goods down there, about getting LNG uh, shipments doubled. And it, it really was an effort that was led by the maritime industry. There was no other way for a recovery effort to be sustained without the maritime industry. Of course, we all know the headaches that were encountered with clearing out the port so we could get the ships in and out. But that still at the end of the day is far and away better than what could have ever happened uh, by any other means. And of course, in Florida, we're prone to hurricanes. I think unless it's over a category, three, if it's under a category three, I mean, everyone's just focused on a hurricane party. And I don't say that lightly because I know you're supposed to take every storm seriously. But as Floridians, we tend to only start paying attention around a category three. But of course, we have seen category three, fours and fives uh, hit our state in recent years. And you look at how this is total devastation in some areas and how we rally as a, not just a state, but as a region. And so many times it is moving emergency relief, supplies, goods all around the state through our maritime channels. I cannot emphasize enough the role that our maritime industry plays in not just the recovery and the response aspect when we're talking about emergency situations, but also in the mitigation part when we are preparing for storms to come, for natural disasters. There's a huge element of the mitigation and resiliency part that the industry plays. And again, all the more reason why I'm so proud to be such a staunch supporter and advocate of our maritime industry. Well, we are grateful for your support. We are hopeful that we will not actually have an above average hurricane season as is predicted, but the people of the American maritime industry will be there uh, to do what's needed, whatever happens. Congresswoman Kamek, I know you are very busy and we really appreciate your time today. Before we close out, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to raise or any uh, aspect of your work that you'd like to dig a little bit deeper on? You know, uh, we talked very briefly about LNG, but I do want to highlight the important role that LNG will play in the future of the maritime industry as a whole. You know, I think that there's a great opportunity for small scale access um, to be expanded in the Caribbean, but also across the globe. And I think, of course, maritime industry is going to be leading that front. When you look at uh, communities and, and, and countries in the Caribbean, it's those vessels that will be delivering the small scale LNG. In Jacksonville, we have the largest bunkering capabilities of LNG um, in North America. And so you think about this and, and how we're delivering, you know, the ISA containers of, of LNG but also you know, barging it down. But then the, the vessels that are actually running off of both diesel and LNG. It is quite an uh, exciting opportunity that I see will be a huge part of the industry in years to come. Lots of innovation and research to, to come, but I think that there is a path forward. And I would love to see even some of our defense uh, make a switch to be compatible with both LNG and diesel. So 
very, very exciting. And that would be my last thing that I would add, but also go Gators. <laughs> <laughs> well, we couldn't close without that. That's probably a good note on which to end. Uh, that is all for this episode of the American Maritime Podcast. Uh, we hope that you will share it with others who are interested or would benefit from learning more about a strong American Maritime. Congresswoman Kamek, we thank you so much for your time and your insights today. I'm Jennifer Carpenter signing off. 